Good evening from Rocky Mountain PBS. I'm Cynthia Hessen. This is Colorado State of Mind. This month, the United States and Mexico signed a historic agreement concerning the Colorado River, the first major change in how each country uses the water since a treaty in 1944. Tonight, three of Colorado's top water experts are here to tell us more about the significance of the agreement and its impact for the future. Justice Gregory Hobbs sits on the Colorado Supreme Court since 1996 and has years of background in water and land use law. He also taught environmental law and policy at the University of Denver. Dick Wolf is the state engineer for the Division of Water Resources with responsibility for administering and keeping Colorado in compliance with the array of statutes and interstate compacts governing water. And Jennifer Gimbel is director of the Colorado Water Conservation Board with more than 20 years experience as a water attorney, including work in the Attorney General's office both for Wyoming and Colorado. The Colorado River starts in the Rocky Mountains near Grand Lake, Colorado, and then flows through seven western states and northern Mexico on its way to the sea. It's the water source for more than 30 million people in the southwest. It irrigates millions of acres of farmland, and it's a major economic engine for communities in its watershed. It shaped the Grand Canyon and is the heart of the vast ecosystem of fish and wildlife. For many years now, environmentalists, other scientists, have been worried about how that ecosystem is being affected by the flows of the Colorado River year to year. And that is one thing this new agreement addresses. Jennifer, you have called this step monumental. So what will it do? Well, the, this is called a minute. It's called Minute 319. And it's not an amendment to the treaty, but it's a way to operate under the treaty. And it's done in, uh, with an agreement of both the United States and Mexico. It's monumental for several reasons. First of all, as you mentioned, it does deal with some ecosystem issues. We're looking at a pilot program that would allow Mexico and the United States to store some water in Lake Mead and then do a pulse flow, essentially release a lot of water to see if it gets to the delta and then look and see how helpful that is. Um, the other reason it's monumental is it accepted, both the United States and Mexico accepted the states at the table as they were working on this. Hmm. That's very unusual for an international agreement. But we were able to explain to Mexico that the states own the water. And consequently, we were at the table and we were able then to help form this agreement. Another reason it's monumental is that we have uh, a way to holistically work the river. In other words, when there are shortages, we have agreed as to how we can operate or how we can help extend water supplies with those shortages. But it also allows Mexico to share if there's extra water in the river, more than maybe what they would have been, in, uh, been able to do under, under the treaty. And they, Mexico has been concerned in the past because it, they felt as though not enough consideration was being given to the water they were allowed to, to store in Lake Mead? Well, what happened with, with Mexico is they were never had in Lake Mead. Oh. We deliver, under the treaty, we're required to send them 1.5 million acres of water. And they take that water and they apply it to their fields or they apply it to M&I uses and sometimes for environmental purposes. So what allows them to do is water in Lake Mead uh, so that in good times they can conserve water uh, by more efficient projects and then they have that extra water to apply in the bad times. So it's, uh, it, that's another reason it's monumental is they're, they're allowed some storage in Lake Mead. And Greg, I know you've spent a lot of time on the Colorado River, I think uh, doing rafting and, and other things. Um, describe how it just sort of becomes a mud flat at the at the end of it. Well, I've been down there, and it is shocking because the river doesn't reach the Sea of Cortez anymore. It just uh, stops and sinks into the ground. But there is a vestigial wetland that ironically is fed by 44,000 acre feet a year of saline water from an Arizona water district, the Welton Mohawk, into the La Senega. And the La Senega is a beautiful wetlands area amidst this delta now that looks almost completely dry where the river itself has ended. So ironically, above the demands of the compact, we have this American salty water uh, going into the uh, delta and you can get a boat and go through these reeds and they're migratory birds. It's a wonderful 
wonderful habitat. But it is shocking because below the Morelos Dam, which is in Mexico, just south of the border with the United States, uh, uh, this million and a half uh, acre feet, uh, 1 million 500,000 uh, that Jennifer mentioned is completely taken into three big Mexican canals. Now some of those canal systems were disrupted by the Tijuana earthquake in 2010 and that's caused some opportunity here. But the point is that people on both sides of the border who are interested in in the environment and migratory birds and just understanding what the delta looked and felt like are interested in having the Colorado River rewatered in Mexico. Well, well, the only country that can do that is Mexico itself. And at issue is their allocation. Uh, you know, they, they were not at the bargaining table, you know, with the seven basin states when the 1922 compact was drawn up uh, in the United States, and they, and they couldn't have been because the states have no power to enter into an international treaty under the U.S. Constitution. So here the most significant thing I heard Jennifer say was that it's Mexico and the United States, basically, dealing with the 1944 treaty and, and having a working operation that is much different than anything that's happened in the past, but inviting the states in because they have a great stake in how the river is operated and how that water storage is, is utilized. And in addition to that, there's a whole layer of uh, other governmental entities that receive water from the Colorado River and then nonprofit organizations that are interested in the environment. So a lot of people would like to be at the table, but the real structure is under the federal constitution, the seven Colorado River Basin states, the United States, and then the United States and Mexico. But given the way that we like to do things these days, we don't like to ignore any of our constituents, so they all get heard in some way. Dick, uh, describe for us, I think one thing people know, even if they don't know a great deal about water law, is how many straws are in the Colorado River? How many different entities have rights to take water out of it? Well, there's, there's many entities. Of course, the Colorado River Compact and the Upper Colorado River Compact deals with seven basin states, the headwaters all the way down, and, and of course the treaty with the Republic of Mexico they talked about. And so there's agricultural uses in, in all of those basin states, as well as uh, developing municipal and industrial uses in there. And as we know, there's a fixed amount of water that's in this basin, and that's why the compact is in place to share in that allocation of that. And, and I'm responsible for that administration of that compact within the borders of Colorado. But uh, I'd like to echo what Greg and Jennifer talked about, why this is so monumental with these discussions how they take place with all the stakeholders because when you have that many basin states in there and this growing demand for municipal industrial use it's very critical that all the states are working cooperatively together on how to manage this resource so that we don't uh, end up in very long litigious battles um, because it is a very scarce resource and growing demand we don't know what climate change will do to that and so there are a lot of straws in there there's growing demand on it more straws coming into it so it's very important that we cooperate together and the compact and the law of the river uh, that it's referred to is very critical in, in helping that all come together. What is the law? And if I could add to sure. that um, with respect to exactly who's taking what out of the river, there is a study out there that's going to be released here in two weeks. And it's a cooperative study by the federal government and the seven basin states. And it's called the Seven Basin State Colorado River Study that looks at exactly that. What is the demand? What is the supply? And what are ways that we can look at the future? What are some hydro hydrologic um, scenarios out there? Uh, if we have climate change, or if, if we go into a paleo uh, set like in the past, you know, and it gets very dry for a very long time. So that study is going to be released in oh. a couple of weeks. And so that will have a lot of answers to those kinds of questions, but it will have more questions than it will have answers. How will that then inform what the court is dealing with week in and week out? Well, week in and week out we deal with Colorado water rights, but uh, we're on such a tight budget here in, the, in Colorado. You know, we can only consume, that is use up, one third of the water that arises in Colorado because these nine interstate compacts and two decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court that allocate water that arises in Colorado. You know, Colorado, the four great rivers, uh, the uh, Platte, the Arkansas, the Rio Grande, and the whole Colorado River complex on our western slope. Well, that water goes to 18 downstream states and the Republic of Mexico, and we can only consume really one-third of it, two-thirds of it, basically. Uh, 
Uh, state Engineer Wolf has this snake diagram that shows the water flows out of state. And you will see the Puny Plain streams, the East Slope, you know, the, uh, the Platte, uh, the Arkansas, and the Rio Grande. And then the West Slope is the big water pocket. Well, 70% of the water that shows up at Lee Ferry, which is the dividing line between the upper basin and lower basin states, 70% is contributed by Colorado, basically through our snowpack melt, but we can only consume about a third of it. So we are already sharing. And then when you talk about historic droughts and then maybe future risk scenarios, depending on climate change, wet or wets, dry or dries, will the water appear if it doesn't? What do we do? Those are all the issues on the table. It couldn't be a more complicated, but a more interesting time. There is, there has been great population growth um, in the last 40 years or so. Well, of course, right along, and we don't, we haven't built as major a structure, say, as the Glen Canyon Dam in in that time. It, is it? Are we past the era of building major water storage facilities? Well. First of all, let me note that without Glen Canyon Dam, Upper Basin would be up a creek without a paddle. <laughs> that dam is our security to make sure that we comply with the compact, to make sure that the lower basin gets their share of the river, but allows us then to continue using the water in the upper basin. So a huge dam like that, I, I don't see that that'll ever happen again. But there probably are the, uh, room for smaller storage vessels to help us manage the water. And Dick and I talk about this all the time, about if we had some more storage vessels in certain places, that would then more efficiently manage the water. How much water is left to be developed in the, in the, the river? You want me to take that? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting agent, for this. Her agency just completed a study on this. All so. right. Right. We, we have done, a, a, we did a study. It was called the Colorado River Water Availability Study. And to the chagrin of many people, we didn't come up with a number. We came up with a range. Ah. And it's a very wide range. <laughs> it's from zero to a million acre feet. That is a wide range. And, and that frustrates people tremendously. But it, there are so many uh, variables that that depends on. It depends, you know, on, on how much water actually goes down to the lower basin. It depends on um, how much, wa uh, uh, you know, uh, building is going on or demand there is in the state. Uh, and so it's, it's the kind of the question of the century. And I doubt that we're ever going to answer that specifically. So what the state is doing now, uh, we're doing a lot of planning discussions with the Interbasin Compact Committee, talking about, well, what's a safe amount of water to develop out of the Colorado River to make sure that we can still use our compact entitlement, but that we're not reaching a tipping point that's going to force, force a longer drought or force a longer uh, compliance period. And so we're, we're, we're looking at that. Something I think I'd add to what Jennifer's saying, too, that's unique about this study that Colorado's taken a lead on is looking at the effects of climate change. And this study has taken in a lot of the climate change models and how that's going to affect the uh, flow in the Colorado River Basin. And it's helping us plan with another study she's doing on what, in the event that we can't meet our compact obligations, uh, how would we mitigate that? And, and if we can't mitigate that, I'm the administrator has to determine who would I curtail in, in the water uses on the western slope and potentially east slope users because there's diversions from the west slope to the east slope. How would we go about in a system of rulemaking uh, to address that situation if we were in a curtailment situation? And, and so these studies that they're doing are very important uh, uh, foundation building studies for that uh, potential rulemaking that we would have to do. So when you refer to global warming, it, part of what you're referring to is this cycle of drought we seem to be in now, right, that could go on for some years? Well, not only that drought, but we know just from a scientific standpoint, looking at the paleo records, that you know we have natural climate change that goes on, and these models are looking at how that climate will be into the future. Whether you agree that mankind's having any additional, in fact, uh, in influence on that or not, uh, can be argued. But we know we go through these cycles of, of climate change, and, and it is helping us, in a more proactive way, try to predict how that's going to be. 
um, into the future so we can plan better. If we think we're going to get into a multi-year drought, how can we best plan for that? And so these type of models are helping us to plan for the future in a, in a more uh, predictive way than we've had in the past. And sure, there isn't a water utility manager or farmer, anybody else that uses water, well, the in-stream flow folks, the folks that are concerned about the fish, aren't worried about the possibility that climate change is real. And what, what real seems to mean is it's going to be more erratic. We've had floods and droughts. Uh, the tree ring studies show that. Uh, that's the paleo record. Uh, you know, the tree rings have the, uh, all the signals of the dry years and the wet years, the way their cores are packed or become more expansive. And then we have 150 years of metered uh, actual stream records. So we know, like the 30s drought, uh, that there's going to be big times of shortages. And then you put in this erratic bouncing back and forth that we seem to be experiencing now, which may be from global warming. So these uh, utility directors, particularly those who have to supply drinking water to our residents, have to look at the range of possibilities. And that's what these studies are doing. A place like Las Vegas couldn't even exist, could it, without uh, the, the water of the Colorado River? That's correct. And then they're obviously looking at other areas, not only within their state, but other projects outside the state to try to meet their future water demands. But certainly, when the compact was signed, they, uh, the allocation was made to them, they did not envision that uh, Nevada, and particularly Las Vegas, would be growing to the extent it is now. And that's created some of the conflicts that is, uh, have arisen in the past uh, many decades. So is there a tipping point coming? I mean, if the population continues to grow, there may, certainly the water is a finite resource. If I can answer that, Please. because this, this is exactly what the ba Seven Basin State study looks at. Ah. I, is there that tipping point? What the study shows is that there's an incredible imbalance of supply and demand. What's important to know is that that imbalance is all in the lower basin, and most of the population growth will be in the lower basin. And so what we need to do is work as seven basin states to figure out how they can meet their needs, what can be done to help meet those needs. Um, uh, desalination of uh, seawater is, is one thing. You know, they look at several augmentation, different augmentation plans, uh, weather modification, you know, snow making sometimes is considered an augmentation of supplies. Uh, there's talk in the study about a pipeline from the Mississippi River to, um, to the Colorado River. I read about that as I was getting ready for um, and, this program. And so program. you'll, you'll see amazing. a lot of different ideas that come up in that study. But, but that is the concern. People want to make sure that we don't reach that breaking point, that we keep up with that demand. And I think something to add to that, that uh, Jennifer's agency is responsible for the issuing permits for weather modification for snowmaking. And, and this is one of those programs that they're looking at, because Colorado being the headwater state uh, is very critical, uh, to, as Justice Hobbs indicated there, about the flow that reaches the Down Basin states uh, really originates in, in the headwaters there. And so the extent that we can look at programs that can enhance those supplies of snowpacks in the upper basin states will have an indirect benefit to those lower basin states. Conservation has um, been a big factor in the last, would you say, 20 years or so. I, I remember after Two Forks Dam was turned down by the EPA, uh, the late Chips Berry, who, who came into Denver Water, had a lot to do with starting t to uh, cut the consumption that we were using in the urban areas um, from that Denver Water was supplying. How far along is there more conservation that can be done? Well, I'm sure there, there has to be. And I think the cities are probably going to be on the front and leading edge of that, and already are. You know, Chips made popular uh, uh, saving water is beautiful. <laughs> and, and Denver Water Department pioneered xeriscaping. That's I, right. you, you recall that drought of 2002, 2003? That's right. Well, my neighbors there right off of Cheeseman Park were pulling up their lawns. Hmm. Others were letting it just go brown because, you know, we know that bluegrass can go brown. You don't need to pour the water on it. And the demand dropped one-third, not just because of, of rationing, uh, but because the people realized that they needed to conserve and save. And landscaping takes up a lot of water. It stretches what in-house consumption would be, you know, uh, for, for drinking water and, and sanitation water might be 5% usage of the water that comes into your household. 
whereas the year-round demand for a municipality is 40% consumptive when you add in all these other municipal uses. Now, certainly we don't want to lose our beautiful parks that we have in Denver and our tree canopy. On the other hand, I would certainly think that conservation, landscaping, other kinds of pricing, which are already in effect uh, for, for uh, you know, excessive use of water and other kinds of signals, uh, really are going to, they're already taking place and as much as can be con squeezed out of conservation as, as possible is necessary. Now Jennifer is leading a study 50 years into the future here and I think it's a four-legged stool now. Would you describe what those strategies are? Yes, we're, we're talking about how to, how to move forward and make sure that Colorado meets its needs and we talk about a four-legged stool. One of the legs is water conservation. What, the other leg is looking at building, finishing projects that have been on the drawing board or, or in the process of permitting. Projects like Windy Gap firming uh, or uh, Moffett uh, uh, firming project from, from Denver. We're also looking at uh, is there a new project? One, is there a, a project from the Colorado River that we can, that we can do? And the fourth one just escaped my mind. Ag transfer. Ag transfer. Which is what we <laughs> don't want you. to do. Yes, agriculture. I'm glad you brought <laughs> that. Thank you, yes. Dick. Yeah, she wants to forget that one. But, well, 86% of our water is still used in agriculture, so it's certainly a very big yeah. focus for us 86%. in the state. 86%. So how is conservation going in that area? Well, that's a good question because uh, how our water appropriation system works, uh, the this use of water under that system, uh, obviously the irrigation systems aren't 100% efficient and those return flows that come back from those irrigation systems over time is what's developed our irrigation projects uh, further downriver over time and so to the extent these uh, irrigation systems become more efficient uh, there's less returns from those projects and to meet those downstream uses that have become reliant on that and so it's been a very controversial uh, subject to talk about uh, because the, the, the way our water law is it's, it's very difficult for someone to put uh, efforts into being conserving and saving water and somehow making that available to municipal users uh, with our complex array of water laws it's it's very difficult uh, and, and we uh, it's a it's a topic that's talked about a lot but uh, and, and continues under some of these studies that Jennifer's uh, agency is looking at and, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is when you start conserving in, in farming it starts less water it seems counterintuitive but actually less water goes into the river so it starts t affecting some of our environmental oh. concerns huh. um, and which brings me then to the in-stream flow program that Justice Hobbs has talked about earlier and this is a program that was developed in 1973 so the state owns in-stream flow rights throughout the state and we own them as a we go to water court and we uh, get a water decree just like anybody else and then we're allowed to place a call on the river should the river get low enough below our in-stream flow right and so it's uh, part of the board's job is to balance the needs of man with the needs of the environment and that's just one of the ways that we do that so you know just to be clear now the crop typically may only consume 50 percent of the water that's put on the field so the return flow is what percolates down into the soil and is moving back to the stream through the groundwater or through surface water through tailwater ditches. So these downstream water rights that have been stacked up over a hundred years depend upon that return flow. So you simply, the return flow is not part of the true matured water right that the farmer has. What can be transferred to a city by lease or permanent sale would be that consumptive use component basically that the crop made out of it. So we try to optimize the use of our water up and down the river, and these decrees speak to where you can divert, how much you can divert, what type of use you can divert for, and where you can place the water to use. So to, say, sell a senior irrigation right, which is, you know, actively happens, and cities want to buy them, mm -hmm. we have a water court process for a change of water right application where the city has the burden of proof to show that there's no injury to other people that depend on these return flows and that you're only taking that consumptive use water and that is what you're going to use under the old priority. So uh, it may sound arcane, but it's all based on we make an actual beneficial use of the water. We've got a very short budget. As I said, we can only use one third of the water that arises in Colorado. It's our most treasured resource. And, and the agricultural, the, the transfers that we're looking at, normally you, you think of buy and dry. The city comes in, they buy up the farm, and they dry it, and then they can use the water. 
the discussions we've had around the state is that's unacceptable. We do not want to lose our farm economy. We want to make sure that that's a strong economy. However, we don't want to be telling somebody what they can or can't do without their property. And so we're trying to look, are there alternative ways to, uh, to sell the water to the city? For instance, in, in a bad year, a farmer would just fallow his land, and then he would be able to have, sell the city that water. So we're, looking, we're trying to find innovative ways to, to make sure we keep that economy. Um, we're running out of time. I want to ask about one other thing, which is this experimental flood that is going to <laughs> shoot down the river to try and um, improve the habitat along in the Grand Canyon. Is that, do I have that right? It's called the High Flow Experiment. And it's from a protocol that was developed uh, by the federal government in cooperation with the states and many, many stakeholders. And the purpose of it is when certain triggers are met so that when there's enough sediment in the system, we can flush these flows down the Grand Canyon and allow that sediment to build up. In other words, allow more sandbars um, for, uh, for the environment and, and to help the fish and, the, and, and what, they, who, what they eat. Uh, so that, that was an experiment that happened here a couple uh, weeks ago. And uh, uh, it's probably going to happen again. We have set certain triggers that when, when we look at where the water is and where the sediment is, if it kind of jives, then, then we've all agreed that we'll allow these flows. And sure, when you're rafting, and I've been down the Grand Canyon four times from Lee Ferry uh, down 187 miles, you want a beach where you can camp out on. So obviously, there's, this is a tremendously... Uh, managed system, but it's also creatively managed when you think about it. The large Lake Powell, uh, Lake Mead down there, the Grand Canyon in between, all that recreation that's in between the glorious canyon itself, uh, and then the water deliveries to Nevada, Arizona, California, and as we started off talking today, Mexico. You know, I know there's a lot more to know about this, but we've, we've come to time here on Colorado State of Mind. That is the show for this week. You can see the program again, if you'd like, at video.rmpbs.org. And we thank very much Justice Greg Hobbs, Jennifer Gimbel, and Dick Wolf for joining us tonight and giving us some insight into this very arcane system of water in Colorado. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I'm Cynthia Hessen. Good night.